the inflammation peaked six or eight hours after the meal. So there was this buildup and lag that took place. And if you think about this, people who are snacking 10 o'clock at night, you're essentially kicking your body into a constant state of inflammation because that's peaking in the middle of the night and then just starting to come down. You wake up in the morning and it just fire it back up again. And that's why fasting overnight is probably useful because your body can get dampened down that inflammation and why continued snacking uh, generally is pretty bad for your metabolism. I think some people listening to this will say, well, hang on a minute, you're saying I can't eat. But I don't think that's the message, is it? It's not that like all food causes this or even that having a rise in your blood sugar or your blood fat is bad. You're sort of talking about the way that these are really big spikes and over and over again in a way in which we probably didn't normally experience them before the sort of foods we eat today. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right, Jonathan. You know, until we did these kind of studies in normal people, we didn't know what a normal blood spike of, of sugar or fat was. So we were still finding our way even back then in those, those first studies. But it's clear that many people can metabolize food and get a small spike, say in their fat, they clear it very efficiently and there's little or no inflammation left over. So it's, it's not like all food is bad, um, right? It's something to do with um, the sort of foods that we're eating today compared to in, in the past. So definitely all foods don't cause an inflammatory reaction. And if you have, say, a, a bowl of mushrooms and lentils, high in fiber, high in, in good fats and protein, you're very unlikely to see any inflammatory reaction. It seems to be uh, really with fatty foods that we, we get this big reaction and particularly poor quality fats, these uh, saturated fats that uh, you're having meals without fiber that you find in ultra processed foods and to a lesser extent, sugary uh, drinks as well. So it's those ones that cause a really big peak say six hours uh, after you've had your meal, you've still got fat in the system. And then after that, uh, you get this inflammatory reaction. So it's a long time after your meal and it doesn't happen in everybody. There seems to be a degree of personalization with that as well. So I think it's, again, we're finding out more and more about how we all respond differently to foods. But for many people, eating bad foods regularly at regular intervals throughout the day keeps them in a high state of inflamm inflammation, which is in a high state of body stress. So you've got this sort of high level of inflammation because you're just eating all of these foods and probably your environment is going to like switched on too high all the time. How does the gut fit into that story? Well, we talk about the gut microbes on this podcast all the time, but there's an, a part of our body that I want to introduce that I think is critically important to this conversation that goes along with the gut, the gut microbes, and that's the gut barrier. So throughout our body, throughout our intestines, there is a single layer of cells. And that single layer of cells has the responsibility of separating the 38 trillion gut microbes that are on one side inside our intestines from our immune system, 70 to 80% of our immune system is on the other side. So first of all, people should know that the home of your immune system is in your gut. It's in your it's gut. It's born in the bone so I So I yeah. would never have guessed that. And it makes a lot of sense because actually this is where, even though it's the deepest part of our body, paradoxically, this is actually the place where we're interacting with the outside world the most. Our skin is a barrier. Our skin locks the outside world. But the gut, this is the place where, you know, in, in a way, our intestines, it's like a it's like a beautiful river. And that river brings clean water and it brings the nutrients that we need that are life-giving. But at the same time, that river at times can be perilous. And there can be things in there that we would prefer to not come into contact with. 
I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to interrupt just for a second because I love only a gastroenterologist could say that our intestines were a beautiful river. I was just thinking about my poor little girl who was violently sick uh, last weekend and vomiting everywhere. And whatever that was, it was not a beautiful river, Will. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you keep going with this beautiful river metaphor now. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I have an optimistic, beautiful uh, view of the intestines, so which is quite different from most other people. It's distorted. Um, so none, nonetheless, um, uh, this is the responsibility of this barrier, which is to allow us to recruit into our body the things that we really want, the things that we need, and yet simultaneously to protect us from, you know, sort of perilous uh, piranhas or whatever you want to call it, that we want to basically keep outside and leave it inside the intestines and ultimately poop it out. And so now th these three parties, the gut microbes, the gut barrier, and our immune system, they're constantly communicating with one another and they're working together. Our gut barrier that has this responsibility of protecting us, it actually renews itself every three or four days. So we get a brand new gut barrier. By the way, the total surface area of our gut barrier is massive, larger than a soccer field, football in the UK. And yet every single, every single blade of grass, there are microbes there that matter every single blade of grass. And so the, the way that we ultimately set this up, Jonathan, is that we want a healthy gut barrier to protect us. The stewards of that gut barrier are the microbes. They build the barrier, they fortify the barrier, they make sure that it's intact and able to do its job to protect us. When our gut microbes are healthy, they're able to do their job the way that they're supposed to. When our gut microbes have been beaten up and broken down, they're unable to fulfill their job. And part of their job is actually to help us to maintain that gut barrier. And when that happens, we are allowing access into our body, things that aren't supposed to be getting in there. And the classic thing is something called bacterial endotoxin. And this is something that you'll find with E. coli, or salmonella, basically the, um, the pathologic bacteria that are a normal part of our body they can actually get across and they inflame our immune system. And this is a large part of where chronic inflammation comes from. So our gut microbes play an essential role in maintaining this barrier to protect us. And just to add that when you eat healthy food, like fiber, our beneficial microbes will eat on that fiber and produce chemicals that are then really stimulating our immune system to dampen down any inflammation in the rest of the body. So that's why there's this link between eating good foods and uh, making sure that our immune system is, is working perfectly, not overreacting, and if anything, can dampen down any of these fires. But it can't do that if it's not getting the right foods for those particular microbes that are very specialized and uh, need real foods to eat. They can't just um, exist on burgers because those, those microbes tend to produce pro-inflammatory substances, things that are going to actually kick up the inflammation more. So that's how our, our diet starts to, to play into this, this delicate balance that uh, Will's talking about. So is it basically you start with um, whether or not your gut bacteria are good and then it leads to inflammation in the body? Or is there also something, you know, is there also a chicken and egg where, you know, I've got inflammation elsewhere and that then shapes my gut microbes? How do we know? It absolutely is a two-way street. So when you have inflammation, the inflammation does affect your gut microbes. Um, so ultimately, though, the part that we have more command and control over are the choices that we make with diet and lifestyle. Those choices ultimately are shaping the environment of the microbes. When you shape the environment of the microbes, then ultimately um, you are creating a specific microbiome that can create an anti-inflammatory immune system or that is going to promote inflammation in the body. So what we mean by microbes are microorganisms. So that means bacteria. It also means parasites. It means fungi and little viruses. But we tend to call them all the same sort of community. And that community is called the microbiome. And there's good and bad guys in there. And if you're healthy, You'll have a good balance of good guys 
and relatively small amounts of bad guys. And essentially, they're all like mini pharmacies pumping out generally healthy chemicals, but the bad guys can be sometimes pumping out chemicals that are increasing inflammation, irritating your body. So you want to get that ratio right, and that's where lifestyle comes in.